Okay, so this presentation is going to be on fireground operations, strategy, tactics, and tasks. That's what we'll be covering here in this presentation. So the terminal objective for tonight is following this lesson, the firefighter will be able to define strategy, tactic, and task, as well as describe the relationship of each to another. Our enabling objectives, what we're going to be able to do is define two fireground strategies, list five primary tactics, list five secondary tactics, identify three tasks associated with each tactic, and describe how the selection of tasks is related to strategy. All right, so somebody give me uh, an answer to this question. What is the goal of every fire ground? All right, yeah, so we got safe, we got protection of life, protection of property. Yep, absolutely. What else should we probably do? <clears throat> Put the fire out. Yeah, very good. Very good. So if we're going to add a textbook definition to it, it's the we want to safely mitigate any given emergency by developing an effective procedure that uses all available resources in an efficient manner. So there's our textbook uh, definition. Now, uh, do we want you guys to remember this at 2 o'clock in the morning when you're responding? No, right? So let's pull out some key factors here. And if I pull out these three words right here, what I want you to take back or take away from tonight's presentation is safe, effective, efficient. Okay? Safe, effective, efficient operations is what we're looking for. We're looking for those three things. Safety, effectiveness, and efficiency. When we bring those together, it's what we call the fire ground trinity, okay? Safe, effective, and efficient. <clears throat> if, I were, if I were trying to, to, to shoot a gun at this target, and I was just trying to hit this anywhere uh, in this, this three-ring circle here, it would be a pretty easy target to hit, right? Now, if I tried to shoot between those two circles where that area is shaded a little bit more red, that would be a little harder area to hit, okay? But where I want to hit is I want to hit this thing right square in the center, the sweet spot. And what I mean by that is I want to be able to operate on the fire ground so that I am safe, effective, and efficient, okay? And the only way that I can hit that target in the center is through safe, effective, and efficient training. So let's look at these one at a time. So safety on the fire ground. We can be safe on the fire ground relatively easily. If we don't do anything, are we being safe on the fire ground? Absolutely. Not doing anything would keep all of us very, very safe. We wouldn't be very effective though, okay? So if, if, we, were, if, we, if we were safe by not doing anything, just nothing would get done. The fire department wouldn't even need to exist because we would be very, very ineffective. Now, we could be effective without being safe, okay? So we could absolutely be effective without being safe. Performing operations on the fire ground that are effective without being safe is an absolute possibility. It's something we could do. However, if we were effective on the fire ground without being safe, there's no way we could be efficient, okay? Because what's going to happen eventually is eventually... Not being safe is going to take somebody out. So somebody's going to get taken out. And if we have one firefighter taking out by an emergency, how many other firefighters does that tie up? Well, if you stop and think about it, it's going to tie up at least the company that's involved with the emergency itself and probably several other companies to help that company get their member out of danger. And as you all know, there's not 150 people clamoring at these doors when the bells go off, right? So we're getting fewer and fewer and fewer people uh, at our, at our, on our fire grounds. So the goal here, <clears throat> the goal here of the fire ground Trinity is to operate in a safe, effective, efficient manner. Okay. And that's what a Trinity is. A Trinity is taking three separate individuals and turning it into a unit. Okay, so we want to take the safety of the fire ground, the effectiveness of the fire ground, and the efficiency of the fire on the fire ground, and meld them into one, into one unit. 
So the way we make the fire ground safe is by selection of strategy. Okay, so we select a strategy based on a risk assessment that allows us to be safe on the fire ground. And that risk assessment is something we've talked about here several lessons ago, and that happens through our risk management process. By us doing a risk assessment to see what we're willing to give up to take on this situation is what our risk uh, management level or our risk assessment is valued at, okay? I risk a lot to save a lot, I risk a little to save a little, and I risk nothing to save nothing. Our effectiveness is a direct result of prioritizing our tactical objectives, all right? So every fire ground has tactical objectives that we have to accomplish. And if we accomplish those tactical objectives, we will mitigate the situation. The problem goes away. We become efficient on the fire ground by assigning tasks that support those tactical objectives while working under the umbrella of the strategy, okay? And that's basically what we're going to be talking about and breaking this down a little bit deeper as we move on here. Okay, so strategy. What we do here to, to describe these things is a football analogy. A football analogy works relatively well to describe this. And our strategy is a high-level plan, and it's a plan to achieve one or more goals under conditions of uncertainty. And that is the fire ground. The fire ground is a large condition of uncertainty. Okay? Uh, and when we reference this back to the football <clears throat> analogy, our strategy is a lot like a game plan. It's the overall plan of how we're going to operate on the fire ground. It's the overall plan for us coming away with a win. And a win here means that we safely mitigate the situation effectively using all the uh, available resources efficiently. Okay, that's the overall plan. Now a tactic, what a tactic is, is that's a procedure for promoting a desired result. So in using the football analogy here, what we're trying to do is score more points than the opposition. And one way that we can do that is through an offensive strategy that gives us the ball, and we try to get that ball from one end of the field into the end zone. To do that, to score points, we apply tactics in the form of plays. Okay, And a play is a procedure for promoting scoring touchdowns. And in this case, what we've done here is we, we've, we're going to draw up this bootleg play where the quarterback's going to kick around the end and we're going to run the ball around the outside of the rest of the, uh, the defense and hopefully score a touchdown by crossing the goal line. Now, a task. The task is the smallest, most identifiable, essential piece of work that serves as one unit. So it's one little unit of work, okay? In this case, in our football analogy, we have to do a couple of things to make that play happen. So tasks support the tactic. We have to block. So we've got the guard here kicking out around. He's going to block some of those defensive guys on the end. And then we've got the quarterback who's running the ball around the end. Okay. Ultimately, it's only the quarterback who can score, but he can't score unless the 10 other players are performing their task uh, efficiently with an effective tactic okay and that's basically what we're trying to get across and we're gonna apply that to the fire ground as we move on okay so strategy it's the plan of how we were going to operate on the fire ground okay the plan like I mentioned earlier is based on the risk assessment of the fire ground conditions we risk a lot to save a lot and we risk nothing to save nothing Remember, when we described risk in our risk management lesson, we talked about risk, and the way we want to remember it is it's something we are willing to give up. So what are we willing to give up to take on the hazards of this fire ground? If there is no reward at this fire ground, then we shouldn't be willing to give up anything. If there's a high reward at this fire ground, we should be willing to give up something to obtain that high reward. That's the strategy. Okay, so we use one of two modes of operation when we're talking about strategy. They are offense or defense, a lot like our football game. When we're offensive, it's an aggressive operation. This includes interior attack hose stretches, interior searches, interior operations of ventilation. Okay, we're aggressive when, when, when we're in the offensive mode. We select this, okay, when that potential reward equals the risk of the operation. 
Offensive operations are high risk. Going into a burning building is extremely risky, okay? So what we need to have is we need to have a reward that equals that risk, either life hazard or a high property value, okay? Uh, and I don't mean high property value by uh, monetary. I'm talking about if I can get inside and stop this fire in the room of origin, I can keep this entire block from burning down. That's what I'm kind of talking about with, uh, with that scenario. Now, defensive, on the other hand, is a much less aggressive operation. It's an operation when we show up on scene and realize that, hey, there's not a lot of reward here, okay? So we select this when the risk of the operation just simply outweighs the potential reward. Uh, there's no lives to be, uh, to, to, to be saved here, and there's no property to be saved because this building is a total loss at this point. So we're not going to risk anything, and we're going to go into operation outside of our collapse zones. So regardless of offense or defense, we have to have some tactical objectives to make uh, this operation effective. Okay, so we apply these tactical objectives, and what a tactical objective is, or what a tactic is, is it's a procedure for promoting that desired result. It's a skillful way of doing something or making something happen, all right? And it's the means by which we carry out the strategy. And we have six good examples here of what tactical objectives are. In the upper uh, left-hand corner here, we have a search. We have a firefighter who's going in to conduct a search. We have water supply, ventilation, more ventilation back up to the top, we have a rescue being performed in the middle right, and on the bottom right, we have suppression taking place. Okay, So those are all good examples of tactical objectives. So you've probably come across this acronym um, in, your, in, in your reading or maybe in a, in a previous drill or a pre previous training session, and that's RECIO versus. So RECIO versus, it's the accepted fire service acronym for remembering tactical priorities. And just to refresh your memory on what those are, is R is for rescue, E is exposures, C is confine, E is extinguish, O stands for overhaul, the V is ventilation, and the S is salvage. Okay, so we have this list here of tactical priorities. It's a good list, but it's better when we manage this list through prioritization of tactical objectives. And what I mean by that is pretty simple. So we're going to take 10 of the, the, the most significant actions that we can do on the fire ground and group them together into two different groups, one being primary and one being secondary. And we're going to base that list on priority of the fire ground. So we're going to take all these things, break them down into 10 significant actions that we call tactical objectives, and prioritize them based on what we, uh, what we find when we arrive on scene. When we do that, we come up with this list of 10 uh, tactical objectives. We break the 10 down into two groups of five. The first group of five is primary tactical objectives. This is typically the first things we want to do on the fire ground. These are typically the things that if we do right now on the fire ground, we will have the biggest impact on the overall scene. So our five primary tactical objectives, suppression, search, ventilation, water supply, and backup suppression. Those are our primary tactical objectives. These tactical objectives have to happen at every single structure fire we go to. Secondary tactical objectives would be the back half of those 10 most important things on the fire ground. And these things typically would be assigned following the primary, but not always. There are times when we will have to control utilities before we can make uh, an attempt at suppression. But in general, these will be assigned following the assignment of the, tacti of the, the primary tactical objectives. So let's take a look at these. Active extension investigation. We want to actively search for where this fire has progressed. Secondary water. We want to back up our water supply. Control utilities. 
perform a secondary search, and perform salvage and overhaul. So those are the list of our five secondary tactical objectives. So these tactics are always going to remain the same. Every fire ground that we go to is going to need these tactical objectives. No matter if we're offense, defense, or transitioning in between the two, we need to perform some type of suppression. We need to perform some type of a search, okay? Even if we're not going to be doing an aggressive interior attack where we aggressively are searching for victims, viable victims who are who are trapped inside the burning structure, even when we are in defensive mode, we're going to be doing a search. Now, that search might just be a simple check of the outside, but we have to perform a search. Ventilation. Ventilation is going to be happening either by our hand, which is called active ventilation, or by uh, natural processes that are already happening, which is called passive ventilation. But ventilation needs to be addressed at every single fire, whether it's breaking windows to support suppression or for companies that are on the inside or breaking windows from the outside to get our water streams inside of a building. And water supply. Obviously, we have to gain water supply. We have to, we have to secure a water source if we're going to be putting water on a fire. And we have to back up that suppression. If we are in suppression operation, we have to back it up. If that suppression operation is using a water can, then we need to back it up with more cans and another hose. Okay? If we're using a hose, then we need to use more hoses to back up that suppression. So these tactics remain the same regardless of strategy, but what will change is their tactical priority. Their priority will change with strategy. Okay? So suppression, for instance, just as an example, during a defensive operation, our suppression, we might start putting water on an exposure before we put water on the main body of fire. All right? That would be a, a, a typical uh, tactical priority change with strategy, but the, the tactical pri uh, priority of suppression still needs to happen. How we conduct that is going to change, and how we conduct these things are through something we call tasks. So the tactical assigned tasks, they will change as the strategy changes. So tasks, those are the, the, the defined piece of work assigned to or expected of a person, or in our case, companies, okay? They are a clearly defined piece of work, sometimes short in duration, all right? And they are assigned to or expected of a person, or in our case, a company. So what you'll notice here is we have the same exact photos in this presentation slide as we did in the tactic presentation slide, okay? Because tasks support tactics, but they are specifically defined pieces of work that specifically support the tactic that they are assigned to. So if we look up top, it's not just a search anymore, it's a search via a hose line. So the firefighter in this case is following the hose line and performing a primary search. Our water supply is no longer just water supply. This water supply is municipal hydrant supply. So now we have the task of making a hydrant to support the tactic of water supply. Our ventilation here with the guys going on the roof isn't just ventilation anymore. They are performing vertical ventilation. It's a specific task of the tactic ventilation. Same with our gentleman breaking the window. He's breaking the window and performing horizontal ventilation. It's a defined task of the tactic ventilation. And our rescue here is no longer just a rescue, it's a ladder rescue, okay? And it's a defined little piece of work that's probably going to be short in duration. Our suppression no longer is just putting water on the fire, we are putting in the water on the fire with a master stream, the application of a master stream. <clears throat> so if we start to look at some of these tasks, um, we can we can dive into these tasks a little bit deeper and what we're going to do is we're going to divide the tasks as to what strategy they reflect do they reflect the offensive strategy okay which is a little bit higher in risk or do they reflect the defensive strategy which is low risk and that's how we have to separate our tasks our tasks much must 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 match our strategy okay so an offensive task for suppression would be stretching a hose line in to the building 
okay, inside the building to the seat of the fire. A risky operation, but our reward here is going to be high as well. We might operate a hose stream outside of the burning building, all right, knock the body of the fire down, and then stretch inside, okay? That might look like it's defensive from the onset, but the intention here is offensive. We're going to knock the fire down, darken it, slow the uh, s slow the, uh, the, the, the the growth of the fire a little bit so that we can get ahead of it as we stretch inside the building. But it's still an offensive operation. Defensive tasks look a little bit different. So operating a hose line on an, in an alleyway, all right, to protect an exterior of a building next to the building that's on fire, all right, that's protecting an exposure. That's a defensive operation. So when we operate a hose line from the exterior of the building to protect an exposure, defensive task. Or we could operate a master stream from outside the collapse zone, okay? Very important here that we are matching our strategy. And if our strategy is defensive, we should not be performing tasks that uh, that are performed with undue risk. So this is one thing that we often don't look at enough. If we're going to operate master streams in a defensive mode, we have to be outside the collapse zone. Otherwise, we are uh, incurring undue risk. Search. As I said previously, search must happen no matter what the strategy is. But what the strategy is, is going to change how we perform that search. When it's offensive, it's probably going to be a thermal imaging camera led search. We're going to take a tick, go room by room, and lead our firefighters throughout the structure, performing an aggressive interior uh, search for viable victims. It might be a large area search where we're operating with taglines off of a rope, maybe in a supermarket or a, a school gymnasium. We're trying to search a large area, but we're inside the building. Again, there's a high potential for reward here, so we're willing to accept the risk that could result in the reward. And vent under search would be another offensive tactic. We're going to uh, break a window, make entry into one room, isolate that room by closing the door, searching for a victim, and then immediately exiting that room. Okay, Offensive type tactic. Defensive tasks. As we said before, even in a defensive fire, we have to perform a search, okay? This might just mean searching the exterior perimeter of the building. It might be as simple as a 360 degree search or walk around the building. Uh, or it might be a search of the exposure buildings, okay? So maybe we can't get in, we, we've completely written off the building that's on fire, but we have exposures and those exposures need to be evacuated and searched. Ventilation. Okay, so offensive ventilation tasks, offensive ventilation tasks, our ventilation period is going to support one of two things. Ventilation is always in support of suppression or in support of search. We don't just make ventilation openings uh, randomly or create holes or break windows uh, randomly. They're always coordinated and they're always in support of either suppression or search. Okay, and those coordination events are well communicated with our other suppression teams and our other search teams to be uh, be absolutely positive that they are in support of them. So, in an offensive uh, manner, this would be breaking windows to support suppression or search. Right. So the the host team makes it to the fire room. Uh, either through radio communication or through visual communication, the outside vent realizes that the host team has made the fire room and they're applying water then they break the window and that that, uh, that allows fresh air to enter that room uh, and, and steam and hot smoke and gases to exit the room it might also be hydraulic ventilation after we knock the fire down we use a broken water stream uh, to to or a, a, a tight fog stream to um, pass water through the window to the exterior of the building and in doing so that entrains air behind the movement of that water and and can and can uh, ventilate a room rather quickly and efficiently but that's an offensive task uh, and then the last one here that we'll talk about on the offensive side is forcible entry whether we're forcing entry for uh, for egress or for entry we have to remember that when we create an opening in a building we are creating ventilation if I open a door uh, just take a, re a regular residence door. Uh, the, the typical residential door is three feet by seven feet. Okay, 
So that's 21 square feet of opening that I am making. If I went to the roof to perform ventilation and I had was tasked with cutting a vertical ventilation hole, I would cut a four by four hole. That is 16 square feet. So you can obviously see that by opening the front door, we can actually entrain more fresh air into a building than we can exhaust through a ventilation hole. All right, now our defensive tasks. As I said, ventilation still has to happen even if we are in the defensive mode, all right, or at least needs to be considered. Because if we don't have an open building, but we are in the defensive operation, pouring water streams on the outside or exterior of the building is not going to be very effective or efficient, okay? So we need to open the building for that stream access. That might mean breaking windows, uh, cutting holes in the metal building, so on and so forth. But we need to create ventilation openings uh, so we can have stream access on these buildings for defensive fires. Another defensive tactic for ventilation is trench cut. So we trench cut a flat roof. We cut that flat roof from one end to the other, uh, and hopefully we're cutting off fire spread, usually typically used for uh, fire spread that's happening in a common cock loft where uh, we have uh, fire that's trying to extend uh, uh, multiple buildings in a, in a block. Okay, But that's still a defensive uh, tactic or, or, excuse me, defensive task for the tactic of ventilation. All right, so water supply. Water supply is going to say, uh, stay the same pretty much uh, as far as the task is concerned for offense and defense. Obviously, when we get into a defensive fire, that could require a, uh, an increase in the amount of water supply we need, but the tasks are pretty much going to say, remain the same. We talk about water supply tasks with three different categories, municipal supply, mobile supply, and static supply. Municipal supply, that's making a fire hydrant, okay? So we have a municipal water main that's under the ground. We have a fire hydrant that sticks up connected to that line above the ground. We connect our fire hoses to it and water flows from that water main into our fire trucks. It's pressurized through the hose and makes it to the seat of the fire. Mobile water supply means that the water is on wheels, okay? So motor, uh, mobile water supply typically happens in a water shuttle where we're moving tankers from, uh, from the water source to the fire scene. So the tanker goes to the water source, gets filled up, travels down the roadway to the fire scene where it dumps its water uh, or pumps off in what we call booster tank backup or a nursing operation and supplies the water to the fire scene. So that's mobile, the, the water is actually on wheels. In static water supply, what we're doing there is we're drafting from a static source and then typically pumping it through a relay to the, uh, to the fire scene. And these static sources could be streams, ponds, all right? We don't, uh, we don't use swimming pools uh, because we can cause the homeowner more damage by pumping out of a swimming pool, uh, but we will use retention ponds, streams, lakes, All right, so backup suppression tasks. We have a couple of rules that we need to go over for our backup lines, just so that everyone understands the backup line. And there are a couple of simple cardinal rules that we always need to remember when we're talking about these things. Okay, backup lines should be the same size or larger than the suppression line. So if we have a two inch line pulled, technically we don't wanna back that up with a smaller inch and a half line. Okay, we wanna pull another two inch line. If the backup line goes into operation, it now becomes a second line and is no longer the backup. This is true for multiple lines. Whenever a backup line goes into operation, it is no longer a backup and it must be considered a second or third operation line. When that backup line goes in operation, we now need to stretch another backup line. So if we had one line stretched to the fire with a second line backing it up, and that backup line goes into operation, we stretch a third line. So we have two lines in operation and one line being a backup. And the process would continue as long as these lines went into operation. So now the backup line operation, backup lines need to be placed so that they protect the egress of the suppression line. That's the first and foremost idea of the backup line. 
the backup line goes where the suppression line is to protect them, okay? This protects them from uh, maybe something happening to their nozzle or a water supply problem. It also protects them for maybe some unchecked fire extension where the fire gets behind them. And it can also protect them when they're below and above grade from the grade above or below the position where they are at. Backup lines also need to be deployed for search teams that are operating above the fire. If we have a first floor fire and the search team uh, is committed to the second floor, we should be putting a uh, backup line into operation into that stairwell to protect the company that's searching above the fire. Backup lines should always be, uh, be deployed to protect the stairwells, okay? So the stairwell, uh, the stairwell needs to be protected whether we are in a high capacity residential setting or a single family residential setting. The one thing to remember here when we're talking about backup lines is there is no such thing as a single line fire, okay? Even if the line only requires one, or excuse me, the fire only requires one line for suppression, control, containment, and final extinguishment, we still need to pull a second line to back that initial line up, okay? No such thing as a single line fire. Okay, now we're gonna move on into the secondary tactics. And like I said before, some of these secondary tactics might need to be completed before a primary can be completed. The investigation uh, of, of extension is one of those, okay? Uh, we might need to have to find the fire or where the fire is extending to before we can suppress it. But even when we have performed suppression operation and we've got our five, tac five primary tactical objectives assigned, we need to immediately assign an active extension investigation. The reason for this is multiple firefighters have been killed over the years because of unchecked fire extension. Okay, You see a lot of line of duty deaths where the report says a sudden change in fire conditions. Many times, often, it wasn't such a sudden change in fire condition, but it was the lack of awareness that the fire was extending someplace. Okay, So what we need to do is we need to conduct this active fire extension investigation, first off, with our exposures. Is this fire extending beyond the building of origin? That typically happens when we arrive on scene. After we've arrived on scene and determined that the exposures are not involved, and we've assigned a primary suppression crew, a primary search crew, a primary ventilation crew, we need to start thinking about checking for where this fire could be. And we want to check above the fire, below the fire, and the top and bottom floors of the building that we are in. We should not confuse this with overhaul. This is not overhaul, okay? This is an active investigation where companies are being deployed to certain locations with inside the structure to simply see if the fire has extended to those locations. Okay, this should be assigned immediately following assignment of primary tasks. Once we've taken care of those primary tactical objectives and we have tasks in operation for all of those, we need to get ahead of this active extension investigation. Companies assigned to this task are gonna need hooks. We're not performing overall here, but we still wanna have hooks so we can pop a ceiling tile or maybe break a, break a hole, an inspection hole in a wall or possibly a ceiling to see if fire is traveling uh, undetected in these voids. When we find extension, it's important that we report it. And once it's reported, the areas that these extensions are found need to be supported with additional hose lines. So if our search team, uh, while uh, searching above the fire, comes across the fire, they need to report the fire, tell Command 8 there is a fire extension to the bedroom on the second floor, and then Command needs to put an additional line into operation to support that extension on the second floor. And yes, if we put a line into operation on the second floor, we also need to back that line up. So you can see how the backup line continues to be pulled and more lines, uh, uh, th these lines kind of uh, double themselves. Whenever one is pulled, we need to pull a backup one with it as well. Okay, the utility control. So uh, we obviously need to control utilities. And the two utilities that we typically are concerned with is electric power and heating fuels. So electric power, um, there's two places we like to control it. One is at the uh, inside the house, I should say inside the house, and one is outside the house. 
Inside the house is typically done by the fire department where we are uh, taking control of uh, the main breaker by shutting it off. And then the outside electric is typically controlled by the utility who comes and physically pulls the meter from the outside of the house. Heating fuels, we need to make sure that we're securing our heating fuels. And when we're securing our heating fuels, there's, a, there's, there's several different types of, of heating fuels we can encounter. We can encounter oil propane, and more than likely the majority of the heating fuels that we're going to talk about or run, run into are natural gas. And natural gas can be controlled by turning off the gas at the meter. Um, and the meter is typically going to be found on the front of the house, either exterior or if it's an older home, it's going to be found on the interior. But again, it'll be on the basement wall towards the front of the home. Okay, secondary water tasks. So we want to prepare for a second water supply. And this is important. This is important for us to remember too, that uh, as we come in later into these scenes uh, with, with, with uh, the, the rescue vehicles and support type vehicles, we want to be sure that we're not parking in an area where we're going to hamper the potential need for a secondary water supply. Secondary water supply, while we don't always use it, it, we always have to prepare for it, okay? It's a separate source from the primary. So what that means is if we're using hydrant supply in front of a home uh, on, on, a, on an eight inch water main, we want to try to get a second water source from another water main. That might mean having to go to a, the next street or the next intersection. Uh, but we want to get away from that primary source, okay? If we just go one hydrant down, we're not technically getting a separate second source. We're just double tapping the first source, okay? But what are we trying to do here with our secondary water? First off, we're trying to back up that primary water, okay? So in case something happens bad with the hydrant or the water main itself, we have a backup prepared. We can easily um, obtain water supply with, with, with very little delay. And the second thing it does is it's preparing us for defensive operations. So even if we're in the offensive mode right now and things seem to be going very well, uh, uh, this fire could get away from us and we want to be prepared to go into defensive operations relatively quickly. And when we move into defensive operations, we're probably going to need a second water source to supply our aerial master streams. Secondary search, it must be conducted at all structure fires, okay? So even if we weren't able to get a primary done of the interior while fire conditions were, 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 were happening because of uh, risk management, we need to perform a secondary search. That secondary search needs to be methodical and thorough. It's a slow, methodical, thorough search. We overturn everything. We look under everything, okay? We don't leave anything untouched. Uh, no nook or cranny not checked. Uh, this is where we go through and we're real thorough about what we're doing. The search, uh, we should start to search as soon as we've had effective suppression operations. So the fire's knocked down and, and the key here is, is that we can ventil start ventilating the structure without the worry of affecting um, the fire. Okay, so if the fire is not controlled, if it's not confined, we can't open this building up because we would support the uh, increase of, of fire. Uh, once we have performed suppression to a point where we have control and confinement of the fire, we can open the building up, then we can get into this secondary search operation. We need to make sure that this is completed by a company who was not participating in the primary search, okay? It's human nature. If I looked over one room and didn't find anything on a primary search, then on a secondary search, I'm going to, I'm going to be prejudiced to that room thinking that I've already searched it. Uh, it's human nature to have this happen. That's why we want a second fresh set of eyes on here. Think about when you've lost your keys before. Maybe you've lost your keys and you've searched all over a certain room for them and you've gone into this room three times looking for the keys and you know you're not going to find the keys in that room and the next thing you know your wife or your husband walks into that room and they find the keys. Okay, That's what we're talking about here. Okay. Alright, so salvage and overhaul. Uh, obviously protect the valuables here, okay? We want to protect as many valuables as we can. That's what our job is. That's why we were called here in the, in the first place. Unfortunately, 
uh, at some fires, fires progress way faster than we can get in to protect some valuables. But we always want to have that in the back of our mind. You never know what is going to be that one item that the homeowner or the building owner uh, uh, really holds dearly. So we're going to protect any valuables that we can once we're to a point where we can start to protect those valuables. And what I mean by that is where we can take our efforts off of either uh, one of the five primary tactics and start worrying about uh, the secondary tactics like salvage. Overhaul is simple, but it's not, okay? We simply want to confirm extinguishment. And what that means is we want to open up every area where fire could possibly be hiding from us. Fire loves to hide in moldings. It loves to hide behind um, uh, uh, light switches. It loves to hide behind uh, or in walls um, where it can just uh, uh, hide undetected for long periods of time and then flare back up again. We want to confirm extinguishment. So that means we want to open up areas and give them a final wet down to make sure that, that there is no chance of reignition on this fire. And then the other thing we want to do is we want to protect the evidence of fire origin, okay? So even if this fire is not suspicious, we want to protect the area and the evidence that, is, that has something to do with the potential origin of this fire, all right? And that, that, that means by once we've located that area, maybe we don't overhaul that area until an investigation is done, um, or maybe we keep somebody there to protect the evidence, um, but we want to protect that area of origin to help the investigation. Uh, and every fire in New York State is going to have to be investigated, okay? So we're required by law, the fire chief is required by law to perform an investigation of this, right? So we're typically going to turn that over to a county uh, investigation, um, but we still need to protect that evidence and protect the area of origin. Okay, so that's a... That's a uh, uh, basically a quick roundup of safe, effective, efficient operation where we're talking about strategy, tactics, and tasks, where we separate the strategy from the tactic and break it down into individual tasks that support the tactic and operate under that chosen strategy. So remember, the goal of the fire ground is safe, effective, efficient operation. That's our overall goal. Selecting a strategy that matches our risk profile makes that operation safe. Prioritization of tactical objectives makes the operation effective. And assigning tasks that support tactics and match strategy makes our operations efficient.